Father, we thank you mm, for your presence. And we love you, Jesus. <clears throat> we love you, Jesus. Mm, Holy Spirit, we just thank you for <coughs> communing with us and for your desire, Holy Spirit, to be with us and to speak to us and, Lord, to... Um, Give us that heart for intercession, Lord, to stand in the gap, God. We ask that tonight as we pray later that you will lead us. Even, even as I'm teaching tonight, Father, I ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds, open our eyes, open our ears. Lord, let us see, let us hear what it is you're doing in the Spirit. Show us, Lord, how we can follow you, how we can best follow you. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for tuning us in and making our hearts sensitive and sharp, Lord. Open us up. Open us up. Mm, I just saw like a, a bowl in my spirit, a bowl of water, like wide open, just wide open and, and full of the water of the spirit. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for washing us with pure, clean water tonight. And we thank you, God. We thank you for those bowls in heaven that are um, being filled, <clears throat> Lord, as we pray, that those bowls are being filled with our prayers, and God, that at, at some point, they're going to be filled completely and begin to spill over onto earth. We thank you, Father. We thank you that you've called us to intercession, Lord, that it's a, a powerful ministry, Father. We thank you, God. Mm, we bless you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Let's just tell him for a minute how much we love him. <coughs> because this is all about him. It's not about us. It's about him. We love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you so much, Jesus. I love you, Lord God. Mm, how I love you. How I love you. How I love you, Papa. I love your presence, Lord. I love your nearness. God, I love your word that instructs me and God teaches me. I love your voice, Lord. I love you, God. I love everything about you, Papa. You do all things well, Lord God. You do all things well. You, you are perfect. You are perfect, Lord. You are perfect. We thank you for that reflection of yourself in us, God, your perfection in us. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> thank you, Papa. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. You are high and lifted up, God. You are enthroned, Lord God. You are enthroned. And the train of your robe, it fills the temple, God. It fills us. We are the temple of God, and you fill us with the train of your robe, Lord. You are just filling us, God, with every extension and every core of your being, Father. You are filling us. We thank you, God, that you are the fullness of us, Lord. You fill us. You are our fullness, and you have filled us with yourself, God, with all the um, every part of the Godhead, Lord, we are filled with you. <clears throat> Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Papa. You're so good to us. You're so good to us. Lord, we just present our hearts to you now, even before the teaching, Lord. Let's just present our hearts to him. Just, um, like, put your hands out like you're holding your heart in your hands. And, Lord, we present our hearts to you. <coughs> And God, we ask that you would open up our hearts to ourselves, Lord. Reveal to us, Lord, what's going on in our hearts. God, is there something we need to, we need to um, repent of, Lord? Is there, is there some change in our thinking that, we, that needs to take place, God, about what's in our hearts? Is there something, Father, we need to confess to you? Mm. We thank you, God. there is just confess it just get it out in the light just that light dispels the darkness <clears throat> we want pure hearts father we want pure hearts when we come before you because the pure in heart will see god those who are pure in heart will see god and lord we can't pray effectively if we can't see you if we're all clouded up and all fogged up and all confused with impurities
Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for <clears throat> cleansing our hearts. Cleansing our hearts, Lord. Cleansing our minds. Lord, sanctifying our imaginations. Lord, sanctify our imaginations. In fact, right now, we set our imagination um, apart, Lord, to serve you. We set it apart from the world and God from all the fleshly lusts and stuff that goes on in our world around us and things we've heard and seen. We set it apart for you, Father, so you can speak to us through our minds, through our hearts, through our imaginations, Lord. We thank you for giving us pictures tonight as we pray, for, um, Lord, for speaking words into our hearts, Lord God. We thank you, God, for leading us. Lord, Jesus didn't do anything unless um, he first heard it from you or he saw you do it, God. Then he did it. So, Lord, I ask that you'd take us into that same place, Lord, that same level of prayer and, and living, not just prayer tonight from 6.30 to 8.30 or 8 o'clock, but, God, living every day, just seeing you and hearing you, Father, and doing whatever we see and hear you do or say. We thank you, Father. Mm, teach us, Lord. Raise us up and teach us. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> I saw a big black bird and it was right behind you and it was like you know and the Lord said the words that came to me was shoo it away because um, whatever it is it's whatever it is it's causing you to this in illness to linger on it's we need to take authority over it right now Go I think it. so take authority over it <laughs> It was ridiculous. I was sick, and then it went away, and then it came back, you know, and, and it's still, like, just the drainage so and stuff. Come on up and pray for her. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. Father, in obedience to your word, you said to shoo it away. So right now, Satan, we command you to go in yes, Jesus' name. Yes, Get your Lord hands Jesus. off of her. You have no authority mm -hmm. over her. We have authority over you, and you are under our feet. So you just get back yes. down there where you belong and stay down there. In Jesus' Amen. name. Mm -hmm. 
them against the ministry in which they stand in or the family in which they are. Father, we stand as one in the circle. We surround them. We thank you for the blood that covers them. We thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against them can ever prosper. Sickness and disease cannot stay. It has to go. Okay, line in the sand, <laughs> I'm stepping across <laughs> it, no more, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> receive it all. Thank you, everybody. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we're going to look. I'm, I'm going to teach something that I, I taught in a class recently before I left to go out of the country, and I think Barb and Natalie are the only ones who heard it. Um, it was for this Wednesday night group. Sheila! Um, <clears throat> but the Wednesday night I was going to teach it, we had a blizzard, and nobody came except us, so we just hung out. Um, So we're going to look at a scripture in James chapter 5, which we're all very familiar with. James 5.16. Therefore, confess your trespasses or your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So what does it mean to pray fervently or with fervency? I'm all about fervency. (laughs) What does it mean to be fervent? Just think, you know, from the context. Persistent? That could be part of it, maybe. On fire? What else? Some other synonyms. Heartfelt. Maybe impassioned. The definition from the dictionary is displaying passionate intensity. So God said for us, he told us, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So if we want prayers that are going to be effective, that are going to avail much or produce much, then our prayers need to be fervent. They need to display passionate intensity. Now, do you remember Hannah when she prayed? And uh, was it Eli? What was it, Eli? Uh, No, the prophet... Eli, Eli, uh, was watching her, and she's praying, you know, and she's praying, like, silently, you know, and, and he thought she was drunk, but she was just, like, praying, like, to herself, it says. I haven't looked that up lately, but I remember it's, you know, she was, like, just praying to herself. She was just quietly praying right there, kind of all, like, encapsulated right in her little space, but she was praying with fervency. She was needing something from God, and Eli misinterpreted it, but God heard what she had to say. So, also, I've heard a a particular teacher who I love to listen to say, um, half-hearted prayers will get half-hearted answers from God. So, if our prayers are half-hearted, if our heart is not fully involved and fully committed, fully, um, just fully engaged, then we're going to get half-hearted answers. We need to fully engage ourselves. And I think we're, you know, we're in a... We're in a day and age where a culture where, you know, we always have a gadget in our hands. We're, we're looking at people, and then we're looking at our gadget, and most of us, you know. I, I'm not usually guilty of that, but actually I went to lunch yesterday with my father and my grandmother and my brother, and my brother was getting on me for having a toy in my hand, and people were texting me. I, they don't normally text me. <laughs> I had to answer. I felt re- responsible. But it, it made me think about that, how, you know, I'm, I'm half-heartedly engaged in this lunch with my family, and how often do I get with my grandmother, who's 89? Not very often. 
and I, and I was kind of half-heartedly there. And so I only got out of the time with my family what I put into it. And, you know, half the time I was on my cell phone talking to people. <clears throat> so the effective prayer, the fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much. Our prayers will be effective when we feel something on the inside. That doesn't mean we have to be loud. Like Hannah was quiet, and she was just, you know, just really, really beseeching the Lord. But she was fervent. She had some feelings. She had something. She had some passion, some passionate intensity going on inside of her because she desperately needed God to move. Now, I've always heard also taught, um, like years ago, especially back in the Word of Faith movement, that God is not moved by our emotion, and he is not moved by our, our we, you know, we don't beg God for anything. We don't wail and cry for God to do things. He's moved by faith. But faith can be expressed in many different ways. Faith can be, you know, just a, a declaration, and faith can be even something quiet, but, but, but it's always, like, staunch. You know, we believe it. It's something, it's, it's not whimsical. It's not half-hearted. And so the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man will produce much. And obviously, none of us wants to come out on a cold, blustery night at 6.30, stay here till 8 o'clock, and have ineffective prayers. So God is saying, engage your heart. Engage your heart, and it will, it will be expressed out of each of us a little differently, um, that fervency. Um, but tonight, the topic that I'm going to address is the prayer of tears. And I have been learning more about it through this book by James Gall called Nailing on the Promises. Anything by James Gall that I've read so far is fantastic. Very full of scripture, very balanced. Um, but he's, he brought a lot of things together, a lot of quotes from the past, from revivalists and people over the years where, you know, there used to be a lot of crying in church, you know, and when somebody wanted to get the baptism in the Holy Spirit, they didn't just get prayed for and leave and go home and say, well, I guess I'm never going to get it. I mean, they, they knelt at an altar for days <laughs> asking the Lord for it, and I don't even, that had a name, what was that called? Tarrying right? Tarrying for the promises. And, you know, they would like just, just press in and press in. And, and, and that was maybe back in a time when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was, it was newer. Like it was, you know, how God's brought revelation of certain things over the years. And it was something they were just embracing. And now we can pray for somebody and it happens so much quicker. Whereas there are other things right now that we're pressing in for that we need to tarry for. And, and there may be some tears involved. And we were talking about this earlier this evening, <clears throat> Natalie and I, about how it's not something you bring on. It, you don't cry just because you're sad and he hears you because he doesn't, he, that, that's not what he's listening for. He's listening for faith. But what I'm really talking about is the spirit of God falling on us and causing tears. And I'm not even saying that tonight as we pray that this will even happen. But I do know when I hear somebody teach about something or I see something happen, all of a sudden in my spirit, I now have permission to walk in that thing. All of a sudden, I, I, I realize, I recognize within myself, oh, I can, I can do that. I can do that? I, I can do that? Like, you know, I, wow, it gives me permission. All of a sudden, this light turns on and I realize it's even available. This is something that's available to me. I can walk in this. I can let God flow through me in this. But before I knew it was there, before I saw it in the word, before somebody told me about it, before I read it in a book, I didn't know I could do that. You know, we have to be introduced to things. How will they hear without a preacher, <laughs> you know, at scripture? And how will they go unless they're sent? And we, we have to hear about things one way or another. So my plan and my, my hope is... I'm going to talk about this tonight, and you've probably heard about it before, but you're going to hear again, and it's going, to, it's going to click something on the inside of you. So when God does fall on you, you'll be ready to embrace it. You'll be ready to run with it, and you'll be like, oh, this is powerful and effective. This will avail much because I'm not just sad. God is falling on me, and there are tears coming out, and there's some, maybe even some wailing and some, you know, something happening here. And, and there's something happening in the spirit. It's not just tears for nothing. He's not exhausting me for nothing, because <laughs> it can be exhausting. Um, in Ezekiel 22:30, <clears throat> God said, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land 
so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their heads all they have done, declares the Lord. Now, this is Old Testament we're talking about, and we're in a dispensation of grace. But yet, this still is a, um, there's, there's some mm, principle, I guess, contained within this scripture. That, you know, what we, what we sow, we will reap. And what the people around us, in our city, in our county, in northwestern Pennsylvania, what we care about, in our 90-mile radius that we have authority over, there's a lot of seeds of destruction being sown. And they're going to reap it. They're already reaping it. I mean, we see it. We see, gosh, you know, we see so much um, abuse. And we see so much just backwardness and people living lives where you know it's not a healthy household it's not a healthy school we have suicides and we have just so much destruction and and God saying back in Ezekiel's day and in our day today I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap wow I just really feel the spirit of God on that wow to stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I won't have to destroy it. And now it's like he's not even going to destroy our land. We're destroying it, you know? We're in this dispensation where we're just destroying it. It's all grace. I mean, he loves, he loves, he loves. He's not pouring out his wrath. But people are agreeing with the enemy, and they're bringing destruction on themselves. And he's saying, will you stand in the gap? Will you make up the hedge? Will you build the wall of protection around these people with your prayers? So, so they won't destroy their lives. So they won't be consumed by the enemy. That it's our job, and it is so important. I don't. I think we'd have even more people. And this is really darn good turnout for prayer. You know, yay, guys! I'm so happy, so proud of you. But we could have even more people. I think if they knew how important the job was, if we all knew just how important and how effective our words. You know, God said light be and light was. It, it, creative power was, cre- was contained within his words, and he's created us in his image, and he's like, okay, go, go, speak my word. You know, listen, open your eyes, open your ears, listen, what am I saying? What, what are you seeing me do? Okay, do it, say it, and you're going to have creative power. And whatever you do, whatever you unleash from yourself is going to be creative in and of itself because you're made in my image. That's power. I mean, that is raw power. Power. That's awesome. And he's given it to us. And we get to walk in it. That is such a um um oh wow, I'm praying tonight. Ah, uh, it's a privilege. That's the word I'm looking for. It's such a privilege, you know, to be able to just do what he says to do and say what he says to do, say. Okay, I'm gonna read a couple of quotes which this arrived in the mail. I gave my copy away to our friend in Asia who we were with last week and so I ordered it and it just came this afternoon from Amazon so I had already typed out my quotes um, so they're on my computer R.A. Torrey writes the prayer that prevails with God is the prayer into which we put our whole soul stretching out towards God in intense and agonizing desire if we put so little heart into our prayers We cannot expect God to put much heart into answering them. The prayer that prevails with God is the prayer into which we put our whole soul. He's saying, like, feel it, you know? Don't just speak, don't just speak words. Feel, if you're going to pray, if you're going to pray, feel what you're praying. Let it touch your emotions. Feel it. I mean, God is a God of emotion, You know, all through the scripture, I I see him coming on clouds of thunder with stuff coming out of his nose, you know, and lightning bolts, and you know, and then he sits in the heavens and he laughs. He's a God of emotion. He's given, we're made in his image. So we need to feel what he's feeling. Um, we, We just, we need to, because that is going to be a more effective, fervent prayer. Yes, Richard, let me put you way back where you started, and I never wanted to interrupt you, but the word meaningful is in this. Your prayers, our actions have to be meaningful rather than rote or what we've heard you say a week ago, you know, meaningful, something that comes from us. That's what he wants to hear. Meaningful. 
that was very meaningful. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if they don't mean anything to us, they're not going to mean anything to him. Because if they mean something to us, that means we are un, uh, releasing faith when we're praying because it's coming from a heart of faith. It's something we believe, so it means something to us. Okay, from a guy named Wesley Duell, another quote from this book uh, about the prayer of tears. Prayer passion is incubated in a heart of love, so we need to have that intimacy with God. It's not just praying because he says to pray. It's not just out of sheer obedience. It's because we're in love with God that we, that, you know, that's what motivates us. That's the force that motivates us to pray is our love for God, being in love with God. It increases out of holy desire. The prayer of tears and feeling his feelings will increase out of holy desire. <clears throat> it may be a special gift of God empowering you for the precise moment he wants to use you in prayer. So he may fall upon you at times, and, and, he, and when he does, you need to yield to it. You need to give in to it. You need to let him pray through you and, um, and be childlike. Because kids, kids, and that's something God's been dealing with me. I know Natalie and I have talked about it a lot. Kids don't care what people think. Kids do not care. And they'll just blurt stuff out, and they'll jump up in their daddy's lap, and they'll throw a fit in a store on the floor. They do not care what people think. And, you know, he wants us. We all have heard those scriptures about being childlike. He wants us to be childlike. So he'll empower you for a moment at times. And you need to just give in to it, just yield to it. And, and there may be emotion involved, because if it's fervent, there's probably going to be some emotion. And just give in to it and let it go and let God pray through you and believe that he's doing something awesome. It often springs forth from a new vision of a need as your eyes are opened. We always need to be praying for our eyes to be open, our ears to be open, because then we get to see into the heavenlies. Then we can see what the needs even are. We might think the needs are what we see in front of us, but really it's something different. And if we have our eyes open, if we have our ears open, then we'll know exactly what he's wanting us to pray, and then things will change. <clears throat> uh, it grows within you as you continue to give yourself to intercession. So it's sowing and reaping. It will revitalize and strengthen your faith. And, and I think it's partly because this prayer of tears, because you're feeling God's feel, feelings. You know, we're feeling his emotions. And I, I always go back to this. You know, we, we go to see movies. We go to see action movies or dramas, you know, chick flicks, because it makes us feel. We feel things, right? We, we feel happy. We feel sad. We feel adventurous, and it's exciting, and we're living vicariously through these characters in a movie. We do that. Our whole society does because they want to feel something, and they want to be able to pick their feelings so they know, I'll go to this kind of movie so I can feel this way. Well, when we pray what God wants us to pray and we enter in on his emotions, we're going to feel his feelings. And we don't necessarily get to pick how we're going to feel because I know he's fallen on me times and people are like, oh, are you okay? And I'm fine. I don't know what's going on with him, but I'm fine. <laughs> Doesn't sound fine, but, <laughs> but it strengthens your faith because it's like, wow, God is moving through me. He must need me. He must be looking for somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge and build up a wall. And I think he found me. <laughs> We need to be willing to be the ones to say, God, here I am, send me. Here I am, flow through me. Here I am, pray through me. Here I am, I'm just going to pray in tongues for a while, God, and I'm just going to sense and, and feel and see what you're doing in the Spirit and, and just let you flow through me. I'm just going to let you speak through me. I'm going to let you wail through me. I'm going to let you do whatever you want through me. It is so fun. I love, I love that when God does that. It's just but I've noticed, usually, I, I'm, I'm asking the Lord. I'm seeking him. I'm saying, what are you doing? And then he shows me, oh, you asked. So nice of you to ask. <laughs> now I'll move through you because you asked. And then there's other times where I just feel a drawing. I just feel this, oh, this heavy, weighty thing come on me. And I'll just go into prayer, and he's just flowing through me. And I didn't ask for it. He just needed to do something, and he needs to use us to get things done in the earth. Things aren't going to happen in the earth unless he has a vessel, unless he has us. I think, I think Jesus could have returned sooner if his people would have prayed more. 
or differently or something, you know. But at any rate, whatever. It is what it is. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19 and verse 37. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What an interesting statement. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What is he saying? Somebody has got to praise God. Somebody has got to cry out. Somebody has got to declare the majesty of God. Somebody has got to express something about God. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So he's saying it's like that, you know, the, all the earth is, is like looking for the sons of God to be made manifest. The whole earth is groaning. Like, come on, sons and daughters, be made manifest. Come on, step out. And, and he's saying, if they keep quiet, it's like it's going gonna, it's gonna to force. Somewhere this has to erupt. So out of somebody or something, this praise towards God or, or an expression towards God has got to erupt. And if it doesn't erupt out of human flesh, he's saying he's going to use inanimate objects, but he created them, and they will somehow magically cry out to him. I don't know. But why not be the one who gets to be the one who cries out to God? I remember when my son was playing basketball, and he was kind of timid, and he, he didn't know the game at all, and my dad came to a game, and he's like, Chris, listen, when that, when that ball comes off the backboard thing, somebody's got to get it. Why not have it be you? <laughs> somebody's got to catch it. Somebody's got to grab it and dribble down the court. Why not have it be you? Well, somebody's got to cry out to God. Why not let it be you? If somebody needs to shout to God and somebody needs to release their voice in the earth, and, oh, and that brings up a great topic, too. The voice that we release in the earth, if he said, it's got to come. And if it's not going to come out of you, it's going to come out of rocks and trees and, you know, other things. Well, there must be some power in that voice that we release. When we give voice to what's going on in our hearts, what he's stirring inside of us, it's powerful. And he was saying, even as he was walking in, uh, where was he going, into Jerusalem? Yeah. They, they, were, they were announcing him, like, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And they were, you know, they were just extolling him. There was power in that. Like, they were declaring that he was entering in to his kingdom. They were, and they didn't even know what they were declaring, but they were declaring things. So and it sounds so benign. Blessed is the king. You know, peace and glory. But there was power. He said, if they don't do it, the rocks are going to do it. There is power when we release things. And we might even make a declaration out of our mouths led by the Spirit and think, well, it was just words. It was, but it's not. It's not. It's got to come out. Why not be the ones that he flows through? I'm going to be the one. Will you be the one he'll flow through? Yeah. And so to be the one he'll flow through, first we have to submit ourselves to him. First, we have to get in tune with his spirit. First, we have to just, you know, pray in the spirit and listen and open up our hearts and, and then let him flow through us like children, not caring. What, what I say might sound ridiculous, but who cares? <laughs> who cares what anybody thinks? Who cares? I don't care. I used to care. I don't care anymore. Just don't care. So... Verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He, Jesus wept over the city. What do you think he was feeling as he saw Jerusalem and wept over it? What was he feeling? No fruit? He was like, ah, oh, you guys aren't producing any fruit. Mm-hmm. 
not, not living like they're supposed to live. They're what? I'm sorry, I'm my other teacher. Remember? Do you remember what I, this teaching from before? You listened and you learned. <laughs> okay, we'll hold that comment. <laughs> what was he thinking when he looked at Jerusalem and he wept? The bondage there is, yeah, all the above, right? Everybody's correct, I think. And he wasn't a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief because he was despised and rejected. He was feeling bad for them, not himself, right? Like, because, oh, you're rejecting God. <laughs> Come on, guys. Okay, so he said, if you, even you, had only know on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you. And then let's skip down to verse 44. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you, the day of your visitation. So first they're... they're crying out and he's like somebody's got to do it and then he's sad about these other people who were not crying out and he's like they're missing the day of their visitation so my question is are we missing a day of visitation is god visiting us is god wanting to visit us maybe he's been visiting you in your time with him in your time where you shut you go in the closet and you shut the door and you pray he's been visiting you what about all the other people he needs to visit what about society? What about our area? What about Crawford County that, that needs a visitation from God? Are they missing their day of visitation? Yes. Big time. Big time. But we're here to cry out on their behalf. And Jesus wept over, I mean, for God in the flesh to be crying about something. That's pretty intense. He wept. He looked at Jerusalem and he's like, oh, I'm here and you're totally missing this day of visitation. I think if it made Jesus sad, it needs to make us sad, you know? We need to feel some sadness over this, that our world is missing their day of visitation. People are dying every day, missing a visitation from God. And you know what it's done for you, right, to have encounters with God, to, to experience a visitation from God. You know what it's done for you. Wow, that's real life, and they're missing it. They're missing out on it. Mm. Yeah. We went to a meeting of a class reunion to do some planning, and um, I was looking on jury to hear someone else say they were intimately seeking seeking God, and and there was nothing there, and. I, you know, I went to each, each one of them, and uh, we listened to the things they had to say, and and I just, I came, I, I came away, hurting in my heart for them. That's good because that's intercession, you know, standing in the gap, feeling what other people are feeling, being the person who, who links those people with God. We have to feel something. If we don't feel something, then we won't do anything about it, right? If you don't feel some pain, like if you have maybe something wrong with a tooth, but you don't even know there's anything wrong with it until there's pain, well, when there's pain, you go do something about it. But you didn't even know there was something wrong until there was pain. When we feel some pain, when we start to feel the pain of the people who are suffering around us, then we start to want to do something. Unfortunately, yeah, pain's motivating. It certainly is. <clears throat> and we have to want to feel their pain, right? We have to want to feel their pain because that will push us into a place of being an intercessor. Um, another quote from this book about General Booth, um, who started the Salvation Army. Several Salvation Army officers in the last century asked General Booth, how can we save the lost? And Booth stated simply, try tears. That's all he said, try tears. Start feeling something for the lost. Care, you know, care about them. And I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else. Care about them. Um, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, 
he bore his heart when he said, Their heart cried out to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief, give your eyes no rest. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the watches. Pour out your hearts like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands toward him for the life of your young children fainting for hunger at the head of every street. So in this scenario, there were young children fainting from hunger. They were starving to death. And the prophet had to say, pray, <laughs> you know, get up, pour your hearts out like water, do something, stand in the gap, ask God to help. Don't just suffer with them. You know, even um, where I was just now in Asia, expecting to see this desperation and like a ah, such hunger because they're, you know, they are very persecuted. In fact, the name of the church is the Church of Smyrna, the persecuted church from Revelation. I saw the leaders really hungry. I saw the leaders on fire. Oh my goodness, the leaders, you know, living for God completely. But I didn't see the people like that. I think even in the midst of persecution and a lot of suffering and trials and stuff, we can kind of just accept it. This is just life, and this is the way it is, and, you know, this is how we live here. And, and, and I didn't see the passion I wanted to see in the people. I didn't see the desperation. Um, until a, a, this famous singer was singing in this conference, and she was singing about miracles. And that's when everybody was like, yeah, you know, and, and, and actually it was her music. They liked her music, but the other guy they weren't, they weren't, and they weren't engaged in. It wasn't just Jesus, you know. It was a certain style of music that they were engaging in, just like we do here <laughs> in America. We, you know, that certain things stir us and other things don't. And I was just expecting to see pure, raw passion all the time because they're so desperate. And um, I just didn't see what I thought I would see. I guess it's just human nature that we can get used to things and we need for God to stir us up. Or we need for teachers to come along and stir us up and we need to be reminded. Paul Cain, have you ever heard of Paul Cain? Prophet from uh, Kansas City. I think he's dead now. I don't know. Um, he said, what if all of us were called upon to accept God's gift of tears? before he would ever consider giving his gift of revival. Hmm. Yeah, all through the centuries, when there was revival, there were people praying. I mean, day and night, all the time, for years, they were praying. And why? Not just for themselves. It was for their community. It was for their area. It was for the people who needed Jesus. And then, you know, the bars shut down, and people stopped beating their wives and children, and they got saved. And, you know, things started getting healthy and wholesome and, and, and happy and joyful and just, just good because God got involved. What if all of us were called upon to accept God's gift of tears before he would ever consider giving his gift of revival? Would you apply for the gift? Would you seek the gift? Would you beg for the gift? If you really want revival, I believe you would. Let's try tears. There's another guy who said, let's try tears. I tell you, there will be no public reaping without some public weeping. The greatest reapers are the greatest weepers. Ministry in the last days is worth everything. It will cost everything. Are you willing to pay the price in much tears, in much prayer and supplication? We need to pray as Jesus prayed, with strong crying and tears. That was Paul Cain, and that's, that's a modern-day guy. So, again, it, it's not... It's not just loudness. It's not just, you know, kind of like when you, when, you, when you bind the devil. He's not deaf. You know, we can shout it or we can whisper it, and the same thing can happen. It's just authority and belief and faith within your heart that binds the devil when you speak those words. So it's not being like, you know, wailing and thinking that that's going to get the job done. It's asking the Lord, God, if this is what it takes, then I want you to fall on me in this fashion. And then when you fall on me, I am going to yield to you, and I'm going to let you flow through me however you choose to flow through me. And if he doesn't do it, then you don't do it. But also, it's seeing the needs all around us. It's seeing the suffering in our society and letting that move us, because we do have just natural human emotions 
and he's given them to us. We should let that move us. We should allow that to do something within us. <clears throat> Psalm 56, 8 is the scripture that you brought up when I taught this last time um, about God putting our tears in a bottle, that he collects them. Another version, I think it's this one, in fact, that I have, the NIV, talks about it being written on a scroll. Record my misery, list my tears on your scroll. In other versions, it says collect them in a bottle. Are they not in your record? So every tear that we cry, that we pray, that comes from us, even just inside, just this, oh, God, he collects it. He writes it down or he collects it in a bottle. Somehow he is taking account of it, and he is aware because it, it's doing something. If he, he wouldn't take account of it if it wasn't doing something. <clears throat> Another Psalm, 126.5, it says, Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. So there's sowing and reaping. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. So there's a harvest. When we go out and, and we're in prayer and God moves through us and there are tears, there is crying, there is or just even a deep sense of, you know, just something inside of you that's, ah, uh, that's a seed that's being sown that will produce a harvest. We will return carrying sheaves with us when we sow in tears. He just, he wants us to feel something. He wants us to feel what he's feeling. Can you imagine what he's feeling looking down on earth, seeing all the suffering and seeing people in their misery and without him and you know, not knowing him, not even knowing about him, not knowing that they could know him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, I go back to that pastor who has a um, place in the downtown mall who I, I heard say he was at a bus stop, and he's preaching to this blind woman, and she, she wanted nothing to do with Jesus. She's like, nope, I don't want it, I don't want it. But the lady on the bench was like, I do. <laughs> I mean, you know, they needed to hear. They need to hear. How are they going to hear if we don't tell them? In Romans 8, 26, it says, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we don't even know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The language of prayer is the language of the heart, and it's not limited to the vocabulary of our minds. There can be a groaning that takes place in us that is effective in prayer. It's not all about speaking in English. It's not always about knowing what to say or, oh, what scripture should I pray or... <clears throat> You know, how, how, can I, how can I word this? I don't even, it's, there's something in our spirit that's supernatural that can come out in groanings. It can come out in the form of tears. It can even just come out in, oh, God. Like feeling the suffering of other people and expressing it that way. He hears that as a prayer. And we're going to see that in John chapter 11. Um, so go ahead and turn to John chapter 11. And... I think I have another quote to read to you. And then I'm going to close, and we're going to pray. Because I know it's, it's late, and you guys probably have trouble concentrating. I know I would if I was just listening. So we will get you engaged. We will pray. Um, hmm, this is my new book that's not highlighted. Let's see. Our knowledge is limited. This is from Wesley Duell again. So we do not know what is best to pray for in each situation. The Spirit's very definite and indefinitely deep desire must be expressed in groanings rather than our words, since our words are inadequate. Spirit-born groaning is always in accord with God's will. The Spirit could desire nothing other. But God can translate these groanings into his fullest understanding and do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. So if you've never experienced like a travail or a groaning in the spirit, start asking the Lord, because it's definitely not something you can just make happen. You can't manufacture it. I mean, you wouldn't even want to because it's exhausting. There's no point. But 
but if he falls on you and you yield to it, it's, it's an amazing thing because when he's groaning through you, you can see things in your spirit. You can see what he's doing in the spirit realm while he's praying through you, and it's just it's supernatural. So why wouldn't we want to walk in it, you know? And, it's, and you're praying for things that you don't even know need to be prayed for. They're things that your brain doesn't know about. And so he can accomplish what he needs to accomplish supernaturally through you praying in power like that. <clears throat> and that's that Romans 8, 26 and 27 thing. Okay, John chapter 11. We're going to close with this. Uh, we're going to start in verse 17 <clears throat> and kind of skip through it. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So we know he's been away. He's like, oh, I'll go, but I'm going to wait two more days. I'm going to let him die. Let him get good and dead before I go back. Even though he's my good friend, I'm, I'm going to do that because I want to see the glory of God made manifest in Lazarus's life. Um, let's see. Uh, verse 21. Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. What are you talking about, sister? I am the resurrection and the life. Wherever I go, wherever I show up, I bring resurrection life. Um, so let's skip. Okay. Hmm. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? So the word in the Greek, <clears throat> deeply moved in spirit, means to groan. He was groaning in his spirit. It means to be moved with anger and to snort with anger like a horse. I'm not sure how to even imitate that. <laughs> I don't know. Jesus was getting down. <laughs> he was deeply moved with anger. Was he mad at Mary and Martha? No. What was he, what was he mad about? The unbelief generally of the crowd. Yeah, he was upset by unbelief. And he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He was snorting and groaning, and he felt anger inside. He just, he didn't say any words to God. He didn't, you know, like, pray to the Father about it. He just was, like, feeling something inside and was like, Ugh. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept, verse 35. So there, we have him crying a second time. Wow, unbelief. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? He's crying because he loved him. No, we know he's crying because he's upset about all the unbelief. But some of them said, couldn't he have opened the eyes, the blind, or, you know, couldn't he have kept him from dying? He did all this stuff. Verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. He sighed repeatedly, and he groaned in the spirit. In the Greek, that's what it is, to sigh repeatedly, and he groaned in the spirit again. It was a cave, and let's go down to verse 40. Then Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. But what did he say? Nothing to the Father. I thank you that you heard me, like, when I talked to you. But what did he say? You can read back through it, because I skipped some of the verses, but you'll see he didn't say anything. There were no words, like John 17, where it's a whole chapter where it's just him praying to the Father. He didn't say anything. What did he do? He groaned deeply in the Spirit and was troubled. When we groan in our spirits, when we feel troubled like that, and we feel like there's righteous indignation, that is a prayer that is going up to the Father. The Father is hearing that as if it's a prayer. It is a prayer. We just don't consider that to be intercession. But it is. Jesus said, I thank you that you've heard me. <sighs> Isn't that fascinating? I, I got that out of this book. I, I didn't crawl upon that myself. I found that in this book. I never, never understood why he said, I thank you that you heard me. I never understood that. When we groan in the spirit, when we feel that, oh, 
That is the spirit within us groaning because he has the mind of God within himself. And he's doing that within us because he has to use vessels. He has to use people. Are you people? We're people. We get to be used by God. We get to groan. We get to feel what he feels. So when you feel what he feels, don't shut it down. Don't dismiss it. Go with it. You know, let that groan turn into something even deeper. Let Just go with it. Move with it. So I, I say all this tonight just to introduce you to this concept or remind you of this concept that God wants to move through us in ways more than just in English and more than just in praying in tongues. You know, there's, there's another kind of prayer, and it's the prayer of tears. It's a prayer that they prayed back in the 1700s and the 1800s for the Welsh Revival and the Azusa Street Revival and, you know, all these different things that happened that turned whole cities and whole countries, you know, on their heads. They cried out to God. They were passionate. They had, they felt God's feelings, and they cared about their society. They cared about people. So let's just be willing to embrace it. If God falls upon us in this way, pursue it. Run after it and embrace it and let him move through you because it's awesome. It's awesome. And he wants to get a job done, and he needs to use us to get the job done. Amen? We are important. Okay. Um, we're going to pray in tongues, um, as we had been back when I was teaching. And, um, Joe, I'm going to give you some music to put on with my computer. So if you all uh, want to just start praying in tongues up here, we're just going to, for like 10 minutes, and then we're going to pray together in a group in the front. So go ahead and start.